Hi, good afternoon. Uh, it's nice to be with everyone. I'm Broderick Johnson. I'm a Tozley Foundation policymaker in residence at the Gerald R. R. Ford School of Public Policy. Uh, on behalf of Dean Michael Barr and the students and faculty at the Ford School, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this uh, important policy talks event this afternoon. I should also say that I am a uh, a very proud Wolverine, graduated from uh, the law school uh, some decades ago, so it's always a great pleasure to, uh, to do uh, an event that uh, brings out the best in uh, the University of Michigan. Um, today, we'll be talking about managing presidential campaigns and lessons learned from this 2020 elections season, and there are lots of lessons that we're learning and that we will continue to learn, but nevertheless, like our panelists, uh, and everyone else watching uh, the session today, I've certainly found it hard to sleep over the past several weeks, maybe the past months, in fact. But whatever the outcome you preferred at the end of this election cycle, I suspect we would all agree that this has been the most uh, bizarre uh, presidential transition in our lifetimes thus far. But we'll leave that for another discussion. Um, before I introduce the panelists, uh, I want to recognize the Towsley Foundation which generously enables the Ford School to bring individuals with significant policymaking experience to campus each semester. As I said, I'm currently one of those policymakers in residence. And so on behalf of myself and the Ford School, I want to thank the Tosley family and the foundation for their support. So let's go on to get on to today's discussion. Joining me today are two campaign veterans from opposite sides of the political aisle, uh, Katie packer Beeson and Greg Schultz. Um, Katie is a founding partner at Burning Glass Consulting, which is a first of its kind all-female consulting firm. It does public relations, political consulting, and issue management with an emphasis on messaging to women. She has worked on political campaigns across the country since 1988 and she has managed campaigns at every level from state legislatures and to governor uh, races to the U.S. Senate and to the U.S. presidency. In fact, in 2012, she was deputy campaign manager of Governor Mitt Romney's presidential campaign. Our other panelist is Greg Schultz, who was the general election strategist and senior advisor uh, to the Biden campaign. He served as campaign manager during the 2020 primaries, uh, Democratic primary, in fact. And Greg is a veteran of the 2008 and 2012 Obama presidential campaigns in Ohio. Uh, Greg also worked as the senior advisor to Vice President Joe Biden and a special assistant to President Biden, President Obama, in the White House during the second term. Um, I've had the pleasure of working uh, with Greg for a number of years, especially in the 2012 campaign. And I, I know he and I both share a mutual appreciation uh, and gratitude for the fact that we were able to uh, help win uh, the state of Ohio for President Obama in 2012, which uh, was a carryover from the victory in, in 2008. And Ohio is a difficult state for, for Democrats to win. So we're both very proud of that. Um, before we dive into this discussion today, a couple of quick notes about the format. Uh, we'll, of course, have some time at the end of the event today for audience questions. Uh, we have, in fact, received some in advance, but you can also submit your questions in the live chat on YouTube or tweet your questions to hashtag policy talks. So with that, uh, welcome, Katie, and welcome, Greg. Let me first um, ask both of you to respond to this question. And putting aside outcomes, um, what did you find most challenging and difficult about serving in presidential campaigns? Katie, why don't I start with you? Okay. 
Um, thanks, Broderick, and thanks to the University of Michigan for having us today. Um, I think for me, the hardest thing about presidential campaigns uh, um, and you know, recognizing that this isn't like serving in combat or being a long haul truck driver or some other jobs that are certainly more physically grueling um, than a presidential campaign. Um, for me, the, the all consuming nature of a presidential campaign is mentally a grind. Um, the, the notion that you literally can't escape from it even even really when you're sleeping, you sometimes dream about it, <laughs> but you wake up in the morning and even before we had cell phones, you know, you turned on the news and they were talking about a campaign. It was on the radio in your car. It was on the front page of the paper. It was, you know, on a TV in the airport as you're walking through. There literally is no reprieve. Um, and, and kind of within that is the idea that everybody is an expert on politics. And so um, you, know, you get on a plane and somebody says what you do, asks you what you do for a living. And in the middle of a presidential campaign, you never ever tell them. Uh, my go-to was that I was a National Geographic photographer. <laughs> 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 Nobody knows anything about that. And so they don't offer you advice. But um, I used to joke that if I came back in another life, I was going to be a brain surgeon because nobody tells a brain surgeon how to do their job. They just cross their fingers and hope <laughs> that they're trained. Um, and in politics, everybody right. is an expert. So um, right. those are the two things that that I think um, are, are difficult about presidential politics. Excellent. Excellent. And you, Greg? Well, no, Katie is right. Those um, campaign dreams are the worst. <laughs> because you just don't escape it. Um, I will say... This is one thing that has gotten increasingly more challenging with the rise of social media, but that is separating noise to what is actually important. Mm -hmm. I remember during the primary having a conversation with a, a leading expert on disinformation and misinformation about what you would see on social media. And, and she said, 98% of what you see online, uh, you don't want to lift up or acknowledge because you are doing their work for them. And then she said, but 2% of it you have to pay attention to. And because it can't, it will become a problem for you. So I said, a very key follow-up question. I said, okay, well, what's the difference? And she said, that's the hard part. We don't know. And so, on, and I have seen in the, in the primary cycle, I remember something started on a far right-wing tweet and then it was on a right-wing website. And then it literally was in conversation on ABC Nightly News that night. And it was, it was not, I don't remember actually right now what it was, it was in the middle of the heat of the primary. But whether it is, you know, for, for the Biden campaign, you had the loud part of the party dominating social media. And as Katie mentioned, I, we, we were called idiots every day for our primary strategy, which won. Um, but I will say, like, it is hard with social media. It is hard with no longer a 24-hour news cycle. You now have 24 one-hour news cycles. And it's like, okay, is this going to last two one-hour cycles or is it going to tomorrow? And that is, there's no good answer, but that is increasingly a more stressful part about these campaigns. Well, I, I appreciate what both of you said about the the uh, the experts that you run into who have like they've never run a campaign ever, but they're going to tell you what you all, you know, what you need to do to turn the campaign around. And, and you, you know, you have to be polite because those are voters. <laughs> right. Have, have either of you have had so for for certainly more than a decade and 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 not suggesting that I didn't have the greatest law firm, uh, law school experience, but if you, or campaign experiences, have either of you had the nightmare though? I used to have this nightmare that, oh, I didn't finish the exam. <laughs> if either of you have ever had the nightmare of, oh, that state, we forgot to have one more event in that state. Do you have those nightmares? Cause you all done campaigns so much. You know, I did have actually one of my recurring, uh, I guess, nightmares during the campaign was I would step into a room and have a test and have no idea what was on the test. And so it's interesting you mentioned that test. I literally had that, <laughs> that nightmare multiple times in the middle of the campaign. So I don't know if there's any uh, people who are green experts um, on what it actually means. But yes, probably. Yeah. <laughs> Katie, you? I've had the nightmare that uh, somebody put the wrong speech up on the podium. Oh, <laughs> and, and the candidate walks up to the podium to give the speech oh. and it's and just starts talking 
That's why it's good to work for Joe Biden. He's already got already got his speech ready to go. Whether <laughs> so, he doesn't read the speech on the teleprompter, anyways. So, <laughs> hey, Greg, what have you found most rewarding? I mean, again, putting aside the outcome, that's yeah. the most rewarding. But... For for me, it's it's the the now the pandemic has made it much more challenging. So I'll I'll kind of reference this more in the primary when you were physically with people, but you know, Katie and Katie will understand and you will understand Broderick. But a a, a campaign week is like six months in, in real life. And so you work on these campaigns, whether it's a presidential campaign, which you know we started six almost 600 days ago, um, or like a state rep race or what it, whatever it may be, the crucible of a campaign atmosphere is just the, the emotions, the intensity, it's the highs and the highs and the lows are the low. And so the community builds in a real way. I've worked on campaigns where you work with someone for four months and, and it's like you went to college with them because you feel like you've had so many life experiences. And yeah. so I've always been attracted to campaigns because of the team building part of it, the shared experiences. Now, at the end of COVID, you basically had all the stress of the campaign, but none of like the normally being a campaign office yeah. for hours and you look next to you at 1 a.m. and there's 10 people there as tired and stressed as you. But now you're like on a Zoom and it's just not the same. So it's the community building that I have always really taken the most out of a campaign. From. And the good food in the campaign offices. Especially field offices. When you get to headquarters, you know, it's not good anymore. It's, no one brings you food. But a field office, you get the best home cooked, you know, brownies and cookies and all the pizza you can eat <laughs> towards the end. Right. Right. And Katie, for you, again, putting aside the the end result, during the for example, the Romney campaign, what what you know, what was the most exhilarating for you and especially around that campaign, but other campaigns? Well, I married our political director, so I think that just reinforces what Greg said. <laughs> um, but for sure, the sense of family. I mean, I you know, if you are in sort of the cycle of presidential politics, you have these families over the years. You know, I have a family of people I worked with for Bob Dole. I have a family of people I worked with for George Bush, um, you know, and then, you know, certainly my Romney family, you know, I was, I, I worked for Mitt on his PAC before he ran in 2008. And, you know, so that was sort of a family, a core family that endured for six, seven years. Um, but without a doubt, the sense of camaraderie and the sense of family. And one thing that I think all of us who were in leadership roles on the Romney campaign would say makes us all feel very proud is that for most of the people that worked on the Romney campaign, it was the best campaign experience they had, which is a lot to say when you actually lose in the end. Usually, you know, people kind of want to forget the losses. But um, we had a great candidate who made us proud. Um, you know, he and his wife instilled a sense of family on that campaign. And all of the, the team that was, you know, kind of the smaller team that, you know, slogged through the primaries and then the larger team in the general um, really felt a, a closeness and a sense of family. And we still have reunions and, and get together and, uh, you know, very much, you know, th those are ties that bind us together, I think, forever. Yeah, you get to see people's kids grow up and then in many cases become the campaign aides themselves, right? And yeah, that's it's it, yeah, it can be really exhilarating that, that sense of family and deep friendships that are lasting. Mm -hmm. So could you describe for us kind of the difference between uh, you know, running a primary campaign and a general campaign, just in terms of maybe even the um the issues, the challenges, but you know, the differences. And Katie, can we start with you about the differences? Um, I mean, there, there are many, many differences. And in some ways it's like a different kettle of fish altogether. I mean, the biggest difference obviously is that you don't win the primary at, on one night. You know, you win and you put everything out there and you leave it all on the table. And then you got to, you know, drink a glass of champagne and then wake up the next morning and start a whole nother campaign. Yeah. Um, you know, so there's sort of a, a marathon sense to it that you or, or maybe even like an Ironman, you know, that you have to compete in a lot of different ways. I mean, a campaign in New Hampshire feels completely different from a campaign in South Carolina, which is a totally different kettle of fish from Nevada 
or Florida. <laughs> and so, you know, you, you really have to become um, experts at a lot of different campaign yeah. styles. You know, you have Chuck Grassley, who's been running, you know, for most of our parents' lifetimes <laughs> in <laughs> Iowa, and he would be considered an expert on campaigning in Iowa, but I don't think I would consider him a presidential uh, campaign expert. Right. And then, you know, sort of more specifically, um, you know, there are challenges in that you're fighting within the family in a primary. You know, a lot of the people working on other campaigns are your friends, sometimes your family, um, and they're people that you know pretty well. And so you're, you know, you're kind of fighting this battle of, you know, do I go with everything that I have when I know that, you know, I'm going to have to break bread with these people, you know, six yeah. months down the road and, and pull together to win a general election. And then further complicating that is that the issues are microscopic. You know, you're trying so hard to find daylight between, you know, in, in our case, a bunch of conservative candidates that used to all believe the same thing prior to the age of Trump. Um, you know, they might have like microscopic differences on military policy or on, um, you know, family leave. But, you know, generally speaking, they're all really in lockstep. And, um, you know, you know, and so that's uh, a complicating factor. So it really is a totally different kind of campaign than a general. Yeah. And uh, Greg, we'll go to you on this. You've been, you were in 08, you went through this and then, and obviously very recently as well. I do want to make note of the fact that like, I'm already so much enjoying this conversation because this could have been, if different panelists had been chosen, particularly Republican panelists, we could have had this kind of Trump versus Biden show, which could have been, I think, certainly less warm and inviting. So I really appreciate that. And I think it's important um, that, that that we've been able to shape it this way. So, Greg, talk about primary versus uh, general from your experience. Well, Brad, you, you, also invite, you also invited two Midwesterners to be on the panel, so I think that helps as well. <laughs> so, <laughs> I will say one of the pieces is the ability to raise money. You, you know, in a, in a primary, we could raise $2,800 per individual. In the general election, by the time our joint victory funds were done, we could have raised, now this is somewhat of a obscene number, but it was like $850,000 per person we could raise. Um, Wow. And that was available for Donald Trump and, and others as well. Yeah. So just the ability to <laughs> raise, it's, you know, so, so, so money raising um, is hard and, you know, and, and you don't have friends in the primary. You, you just don't. And like for us, we had, I was, I would tell reporters, we were attacked by the far left, the far right, Trump, Russia, and 22 Democrats every single day. And we had a candidate who was not going to attack another Democrat. We also had a campaign strategy that the country did not want division. They didn't want division in the country. They didn't want division in the party. They just wanted to be brought together. And so that was a very stressful part of the campaign because we were sure. being attacked. And the strategy and the candidate were not to exasperate that. So the money, no friends or allies. I mean, the day after Super Tuesday, we had, I mean, many big new friends and lots of money. And then the general election, obviously. And then to Katie's point, just the calendar, I do think we've seen the end of the caucus, but a caucus is impossible. It's it's not democratic. There's a whole bunch of things about a caucus, which is a separate conversation. But to go from a caucus to a primary to a caucus to a, to a, a primary, but within the Democratic Party in particular, to go to a, a white rural electorate, to a white, very uh, college-educated, well-off electorate, to a black and Latino electorate to a almost all black electorate. And oh. we have this pressure from all these, you know, the constituency of the Democratic Party. We're in a cornfield in Iowa. They're like, well, why aren't you talking about like this issue? It's like, because no one, we're, that's not relevant in Iowa. Right. Where in the general election, you can kind of talk about anything you want or everything you want because it resonates somewhere and you can make it useful. So those are just a, a few of the, the many differences in I think a primary and a general. They are, sure. they are, they are night and day in many ways. Oh yeah, yeah. So, Katie, uh, you can sort of talk to Greg, in a sense, directly on this one. And that has to do as you were watching, right, the Biden campaign, um, the ebbs and flows, and then finally quite the flow. Were you surprised? Uh, sort of, let's say that, I mean, look, we're, this, is, this is factually true that it was a real, it was a real struggle at the beginning uh, for, the, for the campaign. I mean, there were so many different candidates and 
And, and yet then we got to South Carolina. And as you looked at it, though, what did you think as an outside observer, you know, of how the Democratic campaign for Joe Biden was developing? Well, it it's it's complicating because you would look at somebody like me who's been doing presidential politics going back to 1988 and think, oh, well, I know how this stuff works, but I really don't know how it works for the Democrats. It's a very, very different process than it is on the Republican side. Um, you know, the, the Republican electorate is far less broken up by demographics like gender and race than the Democrat uh, uh, primary electorate is. And so it's a really different kind of campaign for us. Um, and I was actually very hopeful that Joe Biden would be the one to emerge from the primary because I did not think that it would be in the best interest of our country if the general election came down between Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump. I didn't think that that would be a healthy, good campaign um, for the country to watch. And I was nervous about what that could mean. So I was hopeful that it would be Joe Biden. And as I was watching those early primaries develop, I was thinking to myself, you know, isn't it just like the Democrats to, you know, snatch the feet from the jaws of victory? <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I did, of course, know that uh, Clyburn is somebody who has a lot of influence. And so I was very optimistic when um, that development occurred. Um, I think it had a similar impact. Um, and, I, and I won't I won't speak too much um about the specific impact, because like I said, that's not my expertise. Yeah. You know, we did see a momentum shift um, with President Obama when the Kennedys, for instance, joined his effort. And um, it, it was something um, that I think transcended just race. Um, but I think Clyburn, it was such um, sort of a, a, a weather vane, uh, I, I guess is, is a good word um, for Democrats you know, beyond just African American Democrats, that um, it, you know, he's kind of you know, an elder statesman, and it meant something to the party that he stepped forward um, in a way that was unique. Um, and it, it caused, you know, a lot of the party to kind of coalesce. And there is one thing that I think we've seen in primaries on both sides, it's that that voters like to be with winners. And so if somebody looks like the momentum is starting to shift, there's almost nothing that can be done to stop it. And right. um, so I was surprised um, because it, it was starting to feel like it was getting away from Joe Biden, but having done enough, um, or I should say president-elect respectfully, uh, Joe Biden, um, you know, I've seen enough of these campaigns to see that something like that can, you know, flip a switch and the momentum then becomes too strong for anybody to prevent it. Yeah, Greg, then that just to, to build on that. Right. So, of course, South Carolina is so important. But did you sort of did, did you all see that perhaps as like, OK, so we you know, the vice president's gotten his sea legs back now. We've won and then we're going to move on. But then you took off like a rocket ship. Yeah. That, was that kind of surprising in a sense? So I'll start with a few things. Um, one is, you know, all strategy starts with some assumptions and some data. We made some assumptions that the Democratic Party as a whole is a much more moderate, um, moderate or middle than it is than, than Twitter or some of the other candidates would represent. We felt the country actually didn't want to think about their next president. They wanted they prioritized stability over everything else. Joe Biden was that candidate. We also knew Iowa, and, and the frustrating thing for I think a lot of us that have been on since day one, we, we couldn't have been more clear. We're going to compete in Iowa, New Hampshire, but we're going to get through those states. We're going to get to South Carolina. And we had told people we're going to get to South Carolina. It's going to be a two-person race after Super Tuesday between us and Bernie Sanders. We monitored, I remember after every debate, after Iowa, after New Hampshire, I would call our South Carolina state director who had an informal group of, happened to be, I don't know, a dozen black women, 50 or 60 years old. And after every debate, I'm like, okay, where are they? After Iowa, where are they? 
And every time I'd call our state director in South Carolina and he said they're with us. In fact, sometimes they were more with us because they're not gonna let Iowa speak for them or they're yeah. not gonna let some candidate attack Joe Biden in a primary, in a, in a debate and, and get away with treating Joe Biden like that. And so we kept saying, you know, I mean, the, the, the black support and the way the delegate math works in, um, you know, it, it's all wrapped up in COVID hit. So no one I think is fully appreciated that, you know, the, the more democratic a district is, the more delegates it has. The more democratic it is, the more likely it's also more diverse. Only Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders were getting any yeah. any sizable portion of the Latino or black vote. And Biden overwhelmingly and it consistently, no matter what, that was remaining constant. So for us, it is get to super, get to South Carolina. We are going to win South Carolina. We are then going to win a plurality of Southern congressional, you know, Super Tuesday is pretty Southern heavy. Um, or disproportionately Southern heavy. And we talked about, I think, the Alabama 7th Congressional District for two years. We said, we got, and you know what? We got more, we got every delegate in there. I think we got eight delegates in that one district. Every other district, you basically divide and everybody gets one. And so, so for us, it was stay the course, survive to Super Tuesday, I mean, survive to South Carolina, a two person race after Super Tuesday. And that actually all happened. Now, again, the highs were higher and the lows were lower. Yes. But it was like, just get to the, the 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 vote of that actually represents the party, and we, we we said it again. We were like, no one should decide this election until the broad diversity of the party has a voice, and yeah. we said that well before Iowa and even louder post Iowa. And you know, now the way these strategies work, if you're right, you're smart. If you're wrong, you're an idiot. So it worked out for us. But <laughs> and you're smart. Yeah, I, I, genius. I, I will also <laughs> say. Yeah, I will also say Super Tuesday, um, you know, so South Carolina is that Saturday. You then have Sunday, Monday, and then Super Tuesday. Oh, yeah. That Monday morning, I would say Monday morning at 6 a.m., we had no endorsements locked. That night, we had in person Beto, Pete, uh, Mayor Pete, and Senator Klobuchar. Wow. Yeah. So that is when, so I think we expected a two person race after Super Tuesday between us and Sanders. And I would tell people, I would go into like donor meetings or political meetings in December. I'd say, whoever you like, it's going to be Donald Trump, Joe Biden, or Bernie Sanders. The only three choices of the next president. Now, whether or not Sanders could beat Trump or whatnot, I just, right. you know. Um, and then, you know, I think the pace at which the party consolidated, we, we felt it would after Super Tuesday. We felt once it was a two person race, the, the 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 further left of the party will consolidate with Sanders, which mostly already had, and we would start getting the rest. I don't think any of us fully appreciated the speed at which that would happen. Right. But we did have faith that it would. Right. Yeah. So well, faith and discipline. It okay. had to happen because there's no other alternative for the Biden campaign. And we we saw this on the Republican side in the 2016 campaign, where all of these candidates were thinking to themselves, we just have to get it down to me and Donald Trump, and then I'll start taking Trump on. And so if you look back in the fall of 2015, and even you know leading into Iowa, not one of our candidates was aggressively going after Trump because they all believed that their path to victory was yeah. to be the last man standing with Trump. Wow. And to the point about the momentum, the problem is by the time it got to that point, it was too late. The momentum had pushed. And I believe that if Joe Biden had not won South Carolina, I think he would have been in the same position that Ted Cruz was in in 2016. Mm. The momentum, the momentum mm. and again, you know, I may be wrong because I, you know, I don't really know Democratic primary politics, but the momentum would have become too strong, I believe, for Bernie going past to South Carolina, that it would have been very hard for them to come back from that. And, you know, in, in the 2016 primary on the Republican side, there wasn't really an 800 pound gorilla like um, Joe Biden, you know, that was comparable to Joe Biden. We had a lot of governors and senators and congressmen, and but we didn't have, you know, a former vice president that was sort of, you know, the big dog. Yeah. Which yeah. is kind of interesting that Nevada really hasn't gotten the attention it, it should have because we really didn't believe uh, Iowa and New Hampshire voters, the electorate of South Carolina, we didn't assume that they were going to listen to uh, white rural New Hampshire or Iowa. But the fact if we had not gotten second in Nevada, 
maybe we would have won South Carolina, but it wouldn't have been convincing. And the Katie's, you yeah. know, you know, which Katie rolled out with with Sanders, I think could have come to pass. So the fact that we got second in a caucus, which is just hard. You have to remember, caucus goers are further left. They're, they're further left. And Iowa in particular just wants to always pick the next Obama, which is why Mayor Pete did so well there. Yeah, yeah, right. Very, right. very ideologically pure. <laughs> yes, yes, on both sides of the party. Obviously, if you look at who's won Iowa for the Republicans over the years, it's also a, you know. Yeah. I would say terrifying list, but yes, it's a it's a scary list of ideology on both sides. Let's talk about October surprises, and I'll go back a bit actually to the to 2012 campaign uh, because I can't remember when the first debate was, Greg, uh, the debate in Colorado. But let's just say that may have, in some sense, been our October surprise. In that, you know, and Katie, you. Tell us how you all thought, because, you know, let's just say President that was not President Obama, Obama's strongest debate performance. No question. And he always bounces back. So we saw that that kind of felt like a little bit of an October surprise in a sense. Right. How did you all see that? What do you remember about that debate performance and whether it felt like that was, you know, the beginning of a pivotal uh, change in the momentum in the campaign? You know, I think. I don't think that we viewed it internally as a big swing moment only because, um, you know, we had spent a long time watching Mitt debate and, um, you know, he, he has so much knowledge just in his brain that, you know, we didn't, even though, you know, certainly President Obama is, you know, a formidable debate opponent, we didn't, you know, view uh, Mitt Romney as unequal to the task. We knew that he would go in, he would be over-prepared. You know, Ann Romney, I remember telling her telling me one time that the entire time Mitt was in college and in grad school, he was convinced that he was about to flunk out. <laughs> he was just so hard on himself and he over-prepared and was always convinced he wasn't going to have the information he needed at the, you know, the moment he needed it. And every time he was on Dean's List and, you know, excelled, and that's the level of preparation that he always brought to the table. So I don't think we viewed that um, as, you know, a big swing moment for our campaign. It was just yeah. you know, job, the boss hit it out of the ballpark and he'll do it again. <laughs> Let me talk to you both then more generally about October surprises, right? Because I don't know where that came from, but it's a staple of presidential campaigns now, right? It's all, the media certainly talks about it. and But inside of campaigns, Katie, I'll start with you first. Do you sort of sit and say, what's going to be the October surprise? And, you know, you sort of have people saying, oh, whispering, we think it's going to be that or it's going to be that. But do you find yourself sort of waiting to see what did you find yourself waiting to see what might be that October surprise? Well, you know, I think we we used to view October surprises differently in the age prior to social media, because you yeah. worried about what was the surprise that was going to come after you know, four o'clock on a Friday when it was too late to respond with a television ad because you couldn't yeah. get the ad up on the air any longer. So that was kind of the true October surprise. Um, you know, with George Bush, it was, you know, the DUI that came out in the final weekend of the campaign. Yeah. Um, you know, I think we all remember Donald Trump's October surprise. <laughs> um, you know, we didn't worry about any big scandals uh, with Mitt Romney, um, because yeah. he was just such a pure guy that we, I mean, if anybody had come forward with, you know, uh, a bimbo eruption, as Mary Madeline would have put it, um, everybody would have just been like, yeah, no, not this guy. Um, <laughs> so we didn't worry about those kind of scandals. Our October surprise really was Hurricane Sandy, which was an act of God completely out of our control. Um, you know, we felt really good about the momentum that we had. And then all of a sudden a hurricane hits and, you know, Mitt Romney is a fixer. He's not a feeler. So he doesn't do well in settings where you're called on to go and hug people and, you know, show a lot of empathy. I mean, he's the guy that says, OK, what do we got to do to fix it? He's not the guy that's, you know, Bill Clinton feeling your pain. 
And so, you know, and compounded by the fact that he wasn't president, so he didn't have a natural role. So all of a sudden you had this act of God that was tailor made for a guy like Barack Obama to go and hug on people and and at the same time be able to deliver them substantial policy relief. Um, You know, it sort of left Mitt Romney kind of standing there going, well, what do I do now? And um, that's a very tough situation for a candidate that's not a sitting office holder. Oh, yeah. Can I just mention one one little story? We'll go to Greg then about October surprises. So I was with President with President Obama when he was at the the, I forgot what the dinner is called in New York. Yes. Yes. The Al Smith dinner. And, um, you know, we were in the receiving line. Both candidates were in the receiving line. Katie, you may have been been in fact been back there. And I remember they were, you know, both using hand sanitizer, both President Obama and and Governor Romney. And um, uh, Romney said something like, you know, you know, Barack, I actually I actually drink this stuff sometimes. And it was sort of his play on, right? That this is this is like, you know, this this is the this is the like the extent of the alcohol I would drink from time. <laughs> Like, this guy's great. This is absolutely great. So, Greg, October surprises. I mean, especially in this campaign, right? Mm-hmm. You were. So, I would say our October surprise was September of 2019 when the Ukraine effort hit. You know, I think Trump. And it, so, I would tell you the October surprise was a year early. And for us, it validated everything we'd been telling everybody. Donald Trump does not want to run, run against Joe Biden, he's the only person that can win. And for us, it actually validated that our we had had a fundraising, I guess, slump since that first debate from the summer, and then end of August, September, when the the you know the Trump accusations started coming out on us. It, it again, that's when that's when we saw like everything start to pick up. Yeah. And you know, with Trump, one of the things that um, they aren't that di- he's not that disciplined in, in some ways he's very predictable but he just can't he can't help himself like he will tweet something he'll see something he'll tweet on it and we knew with joe biden you know there's a couple i don't say vulnerabilities but there's a couple areas you can go after him he, he was been in the senate for a long time that's true he's older it's true but so is trump but he's you know he was born when he was born uh, <laughs> you know well documented families you know struggles and challenges that a lot of american families you know work through. And so the fact that they, that by the time we got to October of 2020, they had already done, I, I think people were starting to wear on like, and the fact that Trump had like Giuliani as one of his main like surrogates on these issues. I just don't think outside of a small part of his base and the people who watch OAN, like that, that part always, I think reads it. But in, by October of 2020, I honestly think now I think media also learned what they should have learned in 2016. And we were afforded or Trump was not afforded what he was in 2016. I mean, he was able to play the media. The media has never covered Trump wrong. I think they finally are starting to realize if he's lying, just cut him off. And and that's, that's all. he. So there was not a, after Ukraine and the impeachment, we're like, okay, we know what he's going to do. He's going to try it in different ways. You saw with this laptop, which, you know, Hunter lives on the West Coast, why he would drop up something in a crowded, you know, why it was just, it was almost laughable. I mean, obviously the far right networks and social media were like running with it. But yeah. by that point, the middle America that we actually had to communicate with, I think he had already done it. Sure. He sure. couldn't do anything. So let's talk about about changes and campaign t- tactics then for thinking about for future campaigns for for both of you. It's been this uh, because of the of course because of the pandemic, um, the emphasis on getting voters to mail in ballots and to vote early. Um, do you think that that could signal because there was great success with it certainly on the Democratic side in terms of mail in votes and vote and early voting. Um, that these may be sustainable changes in the future and and Greg something, for example, and then Katie to build into, uh, you, you know, campaign tactics and strategies going forward to maximize that because it gives people greater flexibility, perhaps to be able to make sure they can cast their votes. Um, I, I mean, I do think that we're going to be moving in that direction. Um, you know, the the 
even on, on the Republican side, the people that are most involved in these campaigns, the local clerks that you talk to and the secretaries of state know that there's very little fraud. That's just the truth. And, you know, you see states like, you know, my new home state of Colorado um, that have been doing mail-in voting with great success without, you know, fraud allegations. You know, that was one of the first states that got called on election night. Cory Gardner lost his seat. He didn't, you know, go demanding a recount. He, you know, just sort of accepted that he had lost the campaign. And um, I do think it's the wave of the future, um, the, the notion of online or mail-in voting um, as long as we can continue to protect the integrity of the process. As a campaign professional, my worry about it is that it totally changes the arc of a campaign. You don't really know when election day is because election day is different in every state. You know, right. I, you know, almost a month before the election. So nothing that happened, you know, after the first week in October could have an impact on my vote. And, you know, who knows if there's information that comes out. Maybe maybe we shouldn't be at the whim of October surprises and maybe we should be voting with the information we have in the first week of October. I don't know what the right answer is, but it does change the arc of a campaign. And, I, you know, I'm all for lots of people voting, but I'm also for a lot of people voting with all the information about both candidates. Right. Um, I think it was a little different this year because I think there weren't a ton of undecided voters. I think people were going in having made up their minds. But I do worry down the road um, and less about presidential than than, um, you know, more localized races where information is a little harder to come by. Um, I do sort of worry about how the arc of a campaign is affected when you have people voting so early. Yeah. Craig? Yeah, and I, I certainly we want to celebrate, you know, expanded opportunities for participation in democracy. But as Katie mentioned, it also is going to make campaigns more expensive. What in a normal, well, traditionally you kind of work backwards. So like week one is the week of election, and week two is like two weeks out from election day. And normally your your paid media spend ramps up into election day. And now with people voting five weeks ahead of time, you have to basically spend what you would normally spend in week one, a few days before election, five weeks earlier. And so, you know, Katie talks about the arc of just messaging and information, but they're therefore also fundraising and the need to spend more money early, um, which again, I, we want to find ways to expand the electorate. For, yeah. So that's not, that's just a, a, a reality. And I think it's a, it's a good thing, but it will change you know, in particular, and, and Katie mentioned a state rep race, people, you know, look it up in the newspaper the day before the election day to find out who actually are, are candidates. So that will change that a lot. And, and presidentials will just get, you know, if the current financing system remains just more expensive. Yeah. You know, so we saw uh, two very different campaigns and approaches then. Of course, for Trump, it was the uh, big rallies or whatever size the rallies were, but certainly they seem to have driven record numbers for him. Katie, were you surprised by that and uh, uh, how effective that seemed seemed to be? Or was there something else that was going on that led to the kind of turnout that he got, um, you know, with that campaign style? I'm not sure we have enough scientific controls to, to know if one is connected to the other. Um, you know, I had a lot of people saying, you know, I know he's down in the polls, but, you know, he sure has these big rallies. And I would remind them, that, you know, in the final weekend of the 2012 campaign, you know, Mitt Romney was pulling rallies of 40, 50, 60,000 people. Um, so, you know, even a guy that's as vanilla as Mitt Romney, as much as I love him, I recognize that he's vanilla, um, was still pulling, you know, these massive rallies. Um, and I remember pulling into Bucks County, Pennsylvania on the bus, and we just couldn't, I mean, the crowds were like down the highway. And uh, Mitt's big brother, Scott, turned to him and said, man, look at this. Who, who are they here to see? Like, and he was totally serious. He thought we must have some rock band or somebody pulling this kind of crowd. He couldn't believe all these people were there to see his little brother. <laughs> but, you know, I think that, that crowd sizes are, are a good indicator of the depth of support and sort of the enthusiasm of your base. I'm not sure they're very related to how many voters you end up pulling at the polls. Um, right. I just think it's a totally different kind of 
measurement. Um, and certainly if you had no crowds, <laughs> that would be a good indicator that, you know, you're not heading into a winning campaign. But I, you know, I'm not sure the difference between a crowd of 30,000, 60,000 and 80,000, you know, necessarily means, you know, great turnout. You know, obviously he had big, huge crowds and he still lost to a guy who was doing campaigns at drive-ins and, um, you know, practicing social distancing. So I just don't know that they're related. So Greg, who came up with the idea of the drive-ins? Oh, our, our advanced, our, we is have a, blowing? my goodness. Our advanced team is really good. I, we've got this guy named Sam Salk has been running it and we've added a bunch of people from other campaigns. And they're, 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 it's amazingly how creative, the amount of times I'll watch something on a video and I'll be, I'll text our advanced team. I'm like, who came up with that? And they just, they're super creative. <laughs> Whether it's getting a bunch of red, white, and blue pickup trucks. They, they, they are, in the age of COVID, they've, they've really thought outside the box. There, but there, yeah, it was very really fascinating to see there. There had to have been times, though, where you all were like, if we could just get the vice president and and Senator Harris out. On well, the that's, road and more. for Biden, we talk about, you know, you know, a Biden or Biden's strongest asset is his empathy, you know, and, and he is a people person and he's a tactile politician and he like feeds off of crowds, which is, you know. So it was, but you know, when you when you are the the candidate and the campaign that respects science and public health, you have to be the campaign that respects science and public health. And it was, yeah, um, yeah and it was another one of the many times we were called idiots and dumb and dumb. And and you know, you try to follow the science. You don't want to get your volunteers sick. I, I I will also say to Katie's point on crowd sizes. Look at the primary. Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren had huge crowds. You know. It, it, I will say um, one of the best uses of actually getting crowds, I remember how the Obama team, we did it so effectively in 08 and 12, is you get these crowds and then you sign up volunteers. And so while, yes, they're going to vote for you, it's more like, okay, can you get a phone shift or a canvas shift out of the 5,000 people that showed up? And if you can do that, that's worth more than just actually the actual crowd size day up. Yeah, definitely. And, and Greg, you know, I think it was fascinating to me to watch how – um, you all were able to turn something that had become a little, a little bit of a vulnerability for the vice president in terms of how closely he likes to communicate to people, right? And then there was a time when that was like, oh, he gets too close to people. And yeah, as I watched the ads develop, you know, it that became you all use that as an asset because I think it it expressed empathy, and and it's the biggest contrast we have. With Donald Trump. Now, there's a lot, a ton of policy, but yeah. Joe Biden is as human, his humanity, um, is, is, his humanity is what defines Joe Biden and, and everything, his faith, how he, how he thinks about his family. And I'm not saying, you know, and in some ways I would say maybe not artfully, but Donald Trump's inhumanity or some, what people would say his callousness it's just the biggest. And so any way we could show the humanity of Joe Biden, he doesn't like talking about his faith. Biden is someone who would live it, but not preach it. Yeah. We tried to lift that up, you know, and, and, and Broderick, I know, you know, that the, the strength of the Catholic vote in the industrial Midwest in Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin. And so that, that again is something we tried to highlight um, tying in with the empathy piece. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it certainly came across. So Katie, you've uh, let's, let's talk about, um, kind of the future of particularly the efforts that you're involved in. And I'm certain you um, you look at the success of the Republican Party, particularly congressional and maybe at state and legislative levels in getting more uh, women Republicans elected. Can you talk a little bit about uh, your, your view of that and what it may say about what the party needs to do to continue to build that, but also to make sure that, you know, other other populations that have, you know, for certainly to some degree abandoned the Republican Party for a while anyway, uh, can move toward it? Well, just, um, you know, in the interest of full disclosure, my efforts to recruit women and to um, promote women were really put on pause when Donald Trump um, became yeah. the nominee of our party in 2016. I made a personal decision that that was not a party that I could continue to work and uh, and promote and and build, um, you know, for a lot of reasons that I was very public about, so I won't go into them all here. Okay. Um, but I do think that in terms of the future of the party overall, um, 
you know, there are a couple of big steps that have to happen. We have to see, you know, how Donald Trump continues to react to the loss of the presidential election, and then to see what he decides to do uh, with regard to the future. I think as long as he's flirting with the idea of running again in 2024, I, do, I think it sort of paralyzes the party in this moment, this um, party that's very beholden to President Trump and to Trump style politics and campaigning, which is not particularly philosophical. I mean, for the first time, you know, definitely in my lifetime, and I don't know in how long, the Republican Party opted not to even have a platform this year, which um, was something that was unthinkable to me, you know, that it could, could ever occur. Um, and so the party, I do think, is sort of paralyzed in place um, until, you know, Trump decides you know, what his plans for the future are, because a lot of people do feel very beholden to him and it, and it sort of locks it in place. If he does decide to, you know, formally concede the election and makes clear he's not going to run again, then, you know, the future of the party is really up in the air. And I do think that there will be a lot of soul searching and you'll have um, a battle between, you know, from the, the Pence wing and the to the uh, Nikki Haley wing, to you know the Cruz wing, and you know so many candidates that are going to vie for the nomination and potentially be vying against somebody else named Trump, <laughs> um, you know, but without the same sort of um, retail gifts that uh, Donald Trump has. Um, so, you know, I think that that there's a just a giant question mark over the the letters G O yeah. right now. Yeah, yeah. Greg, sort of, uh, I guess, somewhat similar as you look at the, at, you know, the Democratic Party and, um, and much is being made, uh, certainly by, by uh, the media, um, but it's not a media fascination that's bringing us about. There really are some tensions within the Democratic Party that are going to largely affect, you know, what uh, the, new, the new president and vice president administration will be able to, to succeed at. How do you think the, that uh, President Biden will address trying to bridge those gaps? Yeah, well, one, I think just the the temperament of Joe Biden. He is, you know, respected on the Hill. I mean, he's got good relationships with a number of sitting Republican senators and House right. members because he, he he listens. You can look at it throughout his career and you will find people on the right and the left who have, will have said, I came to Joe Biden with an idea. He helped me implement it. He, I think we will talk a lot about getting things done and actually showing action. You can list, uh, not picking any one Democrat, but there's a few that ran for president that had, had that had many of years of service and no bills to their name. Um, so it's one thing to talk and it's another thing to govern and lead. And you're going to see Biden. He's and you can look at the people he is surrounding himself with. You can look at some of the transition teams. It it, it, it and. It represents this country as a president should. And I think you're going to see Biden. He's I actually love when he says, you know, he ran as a Democratic president and he's going to govern as an American president. And I think that's what the vast majority of the country wants. Yeah. It's why he won the primary. It's why he won the general election. And, and we need to actually like temper down. We need to temper down our politics and we actually have to start getting things done again. And, and when you look at things like the environment, I mean, Joe Biden is where uh, the scientists are, but is where a lot of the people on the ideological center and center left and left are and a number of things. And so, you know, we will find ways to make advancements uh, and get things done as a country. And, and I think that will, that will, that will, the proof will be in the actual accomplishment. Uh, you know, Biden, I think is going to work hard to get an infrastructure bill passed and that's going to put a lot of people back to work and it's going to pay good wages. And so, you know, we'll work to have things to show. Yeah, definitely. Yep. Good. So, um, we go to some questions from um, the audience then here, and but uh, so Greg, I'm going to ask you this though: Have you decided what you're going to do next? Uh, I'm trying to. I started to read a book for the first time in nine months. <laughs> I have a two and a half year old son. We went to the Air and Space Museum on Saturday. Oh, I, I'm yeah. trying to like you and you and Katie and, and Braddock. You both know it's like you know it's that's like what normal people do. They like read and, and it's. I'm trying to enjoy like that for a little bit. I've been with Biden now for seven years in a number of different roles, not even counting the 08 and 12 campaigns. So I, I'll stay close, whether that is on the inside um, or if that is something on the parallel outside. 
I'm trying to give myself just a little bit of distance. You should. <laughs> you know, just for some mental yeah. mental health. And Katie, I'm sure you will be figuring out the, you know, the the Republican Party's direction and, you know, presidential campaigns and state and local campaigns as well as you address what, you know, you've 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 certainly established to be some real challenges for the Republican Party going forward. Yeah, to be honest, I, you know, I've been on a bit of a hiatus from Republican politics. And, um, you know, right now I'm kind of waiting to see what happens, um, yeah. you know, in, in these next few months. So, well, so that, that goes then to one of the questions, then, I think. Um, polling. And there's a question everybody, you know, everybody is sort of confronted with sort of what happened to the pollsters and why were they so far off and, and this and that. Um, and it's really been interesting too, Katie, I've said this to a number of people that, that it seems that, you know, some of the Republican pollsters and you'd see them in what, uh, whatever that uh, website is that we all, we all tend to look at. Um, but some Republican pollsters were, you know, um, coming back with, predictions and results that some, a lot of these battleground states were going to be closer than some of the other pollsters were predicting, certainly. Um, what do you think about the future of polling, Katie, I guess? And did you find it more reliable, you know, in past campaigns you've worked for than it seems to be the case now? And when I, I'm not talking about internal polling. I'm talking about the polling that, of course, is done in conjunction with the networks and pollsters, you know, that whole uh, industry. Well, I, I'll say I'm not sorry to see media polling taking a beating. I think that it's been a long time coming. I think media polling is um, a very uninformed, um, not particularly artful way of gauging progress in political campaigns. Um, why, is, why is that, do you think? I think they do it cheaply. I think they do the cheapest thing that they can. They don't really, they're not really accountable. I mean, nobody's you know, calling up ABC, you know, a month after the election and, you know, not doing business with them because their poll was off, you know, so they're all these media outlets want to have a poll because, you know, it's clickbait and they want to have a headline to report on the evening news, you know, or to run on the ticker on the cable news all day. I think it's junk. I think media polling, generally speaking, is junk. There are a few exceptions to that, but generally it's junk. And I think the campaigns have a much better handle on where the polls are at. And I remember, you know, um, maybe, you know, everybody was talking about how this race was in the bag. And I remember, um, you know, something, you know, some email that um, Jen O'Malley Dillon, who I know is a political, you know, superstar, you know, saying this is close. These, these are the states where it's really super close. Do not let up. And I remember thinking to myself, she knows. She's looking at real data and she knows. And so, you know, forget what all these media, you know, polls are saying that, you know, the Biden campaign and the Trump campaign are saying it's going to be close in these places. Listen to them. Um, so, you know, I would like to see, you know, media outlets have enough dignity and self-respect to say this is something we don't do well, so we're not going to report on it. We're going to report on actual news. Mm -hmm. A poll isn't news. Mm -hmm. you know, we're going to report mm -hmm. on you know, what the candidates and the campaigns are doing and how it's affecting people, and forget you know this poll-driven news that you know has overtaken campaigns. I think it has become um, something that influences campaigns, and that should not be the role of the media. Yeah, that's interesting, Greg. I would think I think about the, for example, I can't remember whose poll it was, but the poll like maybe the weekend before, Wisconsin had someone had his, Wisconsin yeah. up seventeen. Seventeen, yeah. So how did what was your reaction yeah. inside the campaign to that? Was well, it said, we, way off, but it might be a little close. No, we tell no, we we always thought it was going to be close, and and I think for us, I think if you looked at our one of the things we we fixed at the start of the primary. In 2016, on the Democratic side, you had pollsters and you had data scientists, and they just kind of butted head all the t odds all the time, and it was just just no good data. And, and so we had a very strong working relationship with our data scientist Becca Siegel, who's run it since day one, and our 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 main pollsters who have been with us since day one. And so we they we at least weren't getting conflicting data. They did their own things, but they worked together, so it was instructive. I think if you go back and look at if they had to link, rank out the top 10 states in order of how close they'd be and how um, important they are, we we always understood our priorities. And I feel confident that our polling and data scientists 
always kept us focused on what was the most important priority order. Because at, at the end of the day, you kind of want to know, like, what's the value of the state and, you know, how important is it to put more investment, more time, more resources into? And so we never, we all, I mean, for two years, we're like, don't look at polling. It's not, especially like national polls. I mean, I don't know why anybody does a national poll anymore for any, for any, for the primary it doesn't matter. And for a general, it doesn't matter. And so just stop doing it. It does nothing, right. does nothing. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the other thing is we've increased the modes of communication. We've overlaid on landlines historically. We've now done, you know, since the primary, we have done, you know, text and online focus groups. And we've tried to just not rely on any one source of input for a polling output. Yeah. Um, so those are just kind of some thoughts on that. Yeah, well, thank you. Well, yes. So for those of us who didn't work on this campaign, the polling drove us crazy. And I would... I would say, I'm not going to look anymore. And then I'd look at it and I'd say, oh, great. Oh, no. What do I believe? And realizing that it's, you know, it's the voters who determine all of this, right? Not the those who predict the scientists, data scientists make a big deal, though. So, yeah, we well, knew it was going to be close and we knew it was ours to lose, but we knew it was going to be close. And that's, yeah. we felt that way for two years. Yeah. Well, we're at the end of our hour. And I really just want to first say thank you both for a great conversation, a very informative conversation, a very pleasant conversation. And, you know, cause we don't have enough pleasant conversations in our body, body politic these days, that's for sure. But I'm optimistic because I'm sure you all are too about the, about the future. And I just want to thank you on behalf again of the, of the Ford school and the, the Towsley foundation and, and Greg, anytime you want to come to the big house for a game and walk, and touch the banner, the Go Blue banner. I think we could probably arrange that for you. But since you're an Ohio guy, I suspect you don't want to do that. Well, Broderick, and, and, and you know, and, and Broderick just alluded to the fact that I've got two degrees from the Ohio State University. But I have been saying uh, for the first and only time in my life since about September that I hope Michigan goes blue for Joe Biden. And so you did. And so thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And Katie, thank you tremendously as well. It's been great. All the best. Safe and happy Thanksgiving and rest of the, the rest of the year to both of you. And uh, I think that's uh, that's a wrap. That's a great session. Thank you both. Thank you. Yeah. Good seeing you, Katie. Good to see you guys. Take care. You too. Thanks.